since we're a little bit behind, I'm going to actually jump over the lesson that would have been for last week, the lesson 4.5 in our discipleship series. And I'm going to jump over into lesson 4.6 so we can finish up our discipleship series today. But before I go into 4.6, I will give you a brief um, summary of lesson 4.5 so we can point out the holiness elements that is in that lesson. So lesson 4.5, if you look at it, it can be summed up mostly by a kid's song. The kid's song that says, be careful little eyes what you see, be careful little ears what you hear, for the Father up above is looking down in love, so be careful little eyes what you see and ears what you hear. I'm, some of y'all knew that song. I heard you sing along. Good job. Good job this morning. <clears throat> so we as Christians trying to live a holy life before a holy God has to be careful what we put in front of our eyes and what we look at each and every day. It is important. In a world full of easy access to media, easy access to the internet, smartphones, little tiny computers in our hands each and every day, we can, there's so much that can get in front of our eyes, so much that we can get just at that quick, easy access, a way to get a hold of anything, and it'll put sin, it'll put things in front of our eyes that maybe shouldn't be there. So we got to guard our eyes to the sin of this world. <clears throat> Sister Linda Bailey, she taught us back in Sunday school class, uh, she would always say the saying about you can't stop a bird from flying over your head. Yeah, I see some people shake, but you can stop it from building a nest. So meaning you can't control what's going to come in front of you each and every day. We can't control it. You know, we'll be walking down the road or some, some will come in front of us, but we can control the looking away part. We can control our part of it, to look away from it, to not keep it in front of us, to turn our heads, not entertain it. Because the more we keep looking at it, the more we keep entertaining it, the more we keep staring at it, getting that into our hearts and our minds, the more that will pull us away from our God, from our holy God, the more it will pull us away from being holy and more like the world. My youth pastor when I was growing up, <clears throat> He always talked about the etch-a-sketch. You know, you see something, you shake it, the bounce, you got to bounce the other way and keep on going. You know, that's what he taught us. We can't, we got to make sure we turn away from that stuff. Look away from those evil things. Focus our eyes on what is good. We also need to be careful about what we hear, what we listen to, what we let come through our ears. And music is a big one. It is a big one. It can change your mood. Music can change your muse, mood. It can be used to hype people up. If you've ever been to any football, basketball, volleyball, any type of game, they'll start up with some music and they'll try to get you all hyped up, get you pumped up, ready to go. Or it can be used to calm people down. In 1 Samuel, when King Saul had disobeyed God and um, the Lord had went away from King Saul, at that point, Saul would get to these times that he would become so angry, get into these big fits of rage to where David would have to come in and David would play the harp and it would calm the evil spirits inside of them. So it even shows us that the music, the, the things we listen to, the things that come through our ears, they can change us. It can change how we are. Music can change our thought patterns. Since it's Christmas time of the year, I will use that one. When you listen to Christmas music, Unless you're just one of those people that just hate and despise Christmas music. Can't believe those people. But it would get you mostly thinking about maybe family, times, times and events, things that you remember, playing in the snow, doing this with your family. It brings thoughts. It should bring you into a good mood, those, that Christmas type of music. Talking about our Savior and being born and everything. It can bring good mood inside of us. But it's not just about music, that what we listen to, but also through conversations that we listen to. TV shows, movies, um, crude, foul language, off-color jokes, all that stuff coming in. If we listen to nothing but trash, that's all that's going to come out of you. If that's all that you put in you, that's all that's going to come out of you. In the computer world, when you're writing code, 
they have a, a saying called garbage in, garbage out. If, if all your code, all the code that's in there is bad code, all that you're going to get out is nothing but junk, bad stuff out of it. But if you put in good code, then good results will come forth. So we need to have only pure and good things go in us so only pure and good things will then come out of us. So it's important to what we listen to in our lives. We need to make sure that we get Jesus in us, the Word of God in us, prayer time in us, fasting time within us. Then Jesus and pure and holy things will come out of us. Because what you put in you, you will get out of you. That's what will come out. <clears throat> So lastly, on lesson 3.5 is what we wear. We need to make sure that we are covered up. In the first book of the Bible, Genesis, we read where Adam and Eve were walking around naked in the garden. They didn't know they were. Didn't bother them at all. But then when they ate of that forbidden fruit, they saw that they were naked. They felt ashamed. They made for themselves some type of clothes to cover themselves up. They needed to cover their bodies in the presence of the Lord. But once they had that understanding, it wasn't God that said, oh, now you got to put on clothes. As soon as they did it, they realized it inside of themselves. i got to cover up my body. I can't walk around like this. And also we see inside of Mark, when Jesus heals a, a man that was possessed with a legion of devils, we see once he's healed this guy, then the people of the village who knew how crazy this guy was because he ran around naked, did all this crazy stuff, they came to see what happens. And we see this in Mark 5 and 15. And they come to Jesus to see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Once he got his healing, he knew that he couldn't run around naked anymore, that he needed to be clothed. When he was in his right mind, he covered himself up. To be holy, we can't run around half dress. We need to make sure that we cover up our bodies. To be holy, we need to cover ourselves up. And in a world that's wanting to twist and say that there's more genders in this world, we got to stick with what the Word of God says. God says He made male and He made female. The world wants to blur the lines, but if we desire to be holy like our Lord God calls us to be holy, then we must make sure that we show that man is a man and a woman is a woman, and not following the blurring of the lines that the world likes to do. So now I'll just I'll go ahead and move on to uh, this week's lesson, 4.6, to make sure we have enough time. But I just want to make sure to give you a little brief hit of what 3. or 4.5 would have been. <clears throat> so 4.6 is separated for a purpose. And the focus uh, text there is, since our lives reflect how God saved us, our actions should magnify Him, His message, and even His holiness. And then in Ruth chapter number 1, starting at verse number 8. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm trying to get over all this mess myself. <clears throat> and Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to your mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. And the Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said in her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters, why wilt ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am old to have for I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Oprah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. So the book of Ruth begins with a famine in the land of Israel, a famine that lasted long enough for this family to abandon their home and to travel to another country, to start over in that land. The story wastes no time telling us the bad things that happened in Moab. 
It didn't take long at all. It jumped straight into it. Naomi's husband died. Her two sons, they got married. But then 10 days or 10 years later, they died. All Naomi was left was two daughter-in-law. No grandchildren, nobody to do the heir, just two daughter-in-laws. That is when Naomi decided it's time. It's time to go back home, to go back to her people, Israel. She tried to convince both her daughters-in-laws to stay. Don't come with me. But Ruth said no. She said this in Ruth 1 and 16. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, Naomi, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Where thou diest, I will die. And where thou art buried, the Lord do so to me. And more also, if off not, or aught but dead, Death part thee from me. Sorry. So Ruth went with Naomi. She said, there's no way I'm going to leave you. I'm going to go with you. So she went back with her to Bethlehem. They were poor. They didn't have anything. They didn't have no men to provide for them. It was just those two women. So Ruth, she had to go out and help gather some grain to help feed Naomi and herself, help them survive during this hard times that they were in. And this is when we see things start to turn around for these two women. We start to see a change in the situation. The story introduces us to the coming Savior, the Redeemer for them. Ruth, she meets Boaz. She meets her Redeemer. Ruth, she immediately found favor in Boaz's eyes. She must have been very pretty. She found it quickly. Boaz put on the charm. He got all out there. You know, he was looking good. He was being extra nice to her. Said, drop a little more than you would out there on the field. Make, make sure she has a lot to carry here. You know, be really good to this girl. And because of that, Ruth fell down at his feet and she thanked him for his kindness. She was very thankful of what had happened here. That made Boaz want to respond even more graciously to her because of her heart, because of her spirit that was inside of her. So during this time in Israel, the law of Moses said that a close male relative could purchase the land of a widow, and he would marry the widow, and when they had a son, that son would receive the name, receive the name in the land of the first husband. That act alone would make sure that the first husband's family line inheritance would continue from generation to generation. So when Naomi, she heard about Boaz, kindness to Ruth, she knew exactly what needed to be done. So Naomi instructed Ruth, she said, you need to follow this law. This is the law of the land. Follow this law and ask Boaz to be the redeemer for the family. Boaz, since we know, obviously had a thing for her, you know, obviously. So he was very eager to be the redeemer for the family. Verse 3 and 11, we hear this. And now my daughter, this is Boaz, tells her, Fear not, for I will do to thee all that thou requires. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. He said, you're a very virtuous woman for all that you're doing for your mother-in-law, that you didn't just leave her, but you followed her to her home, to a land that you knew nothing about. And you're even working to help provide for her. You're doing all this. You're such a virtuous woman. I will be your redeemer. I will help you out. So then that's when we hear the wedding bells. They get married. So Ruth and Boaz get married and they give birth to their firstborn son. Uh, Ruth had fully and completely embraced and pursued the life that Naomi lived. This wasn't the way she was raised. She was from a different country. She wasn't raised in the same laws as the Israelites. She wasn't raised the same way Naomi was, but she decided to make Naomi's God her God, to pursue the life that Naomi lived. And because of her actions, because of that, her actions glorified God And some of the women in the town said this about her in Ruth 4 and 14. And the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without the kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee the restorer of thy life and the nourisher of thy old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne her. Her daughter-in-law, which is better than her, than seven sons. What a story that came out of this because 
She embraced her purpose. Ruth embraced the purpose that was set out in front of her. And what's even, what's even better about the story, what makes it so great, what they said here, is shown in the very end of the book of Ruth, which to me, if you really look at it and understand, it's the very, the very last chapter is some of the best when it just talks about the genealogy of Ruth's descendants means more than anything else in the whole book there. Because from Ruth, it shows that the great King David came from her line, from the woman who forsook her land and embraced her purpose. And not just that, but it goes on to show that the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ himself, the foretold, came from her line because she was willing to obey. She was willing to embrace her purpose, to do what she was called to do. Ruth's actions reminded her mother-in-law of God's faithfulness and helped prepare the way for a king, not just the greatest king that Israel would ever have, but also for the Messiah, Jesus Christ, just by embracing her purpose. Are we ready and willing today to embrace ours? Who knows what would happen, what we could see in our lives, what we could see in the lives of others if we would just embrace our purpose to see what God could do in our lives, just like he did with Ruth. So that brings us to our focus point one, which is God's purpose for all people. God's main purpose is that every person will be restored to a right relationship with him. When we serve God, his purpose becomes our purpose. Our lives should point people to the loving God who wants to save them. 2 Corinthians 5 and 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us to the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled unto God. Since the very dawn of time itself, it's been God's purpose to make a way for everyone to know him. For each and every one of us, that is his purpose. That is his desire. He wants to know us all. And he's given us the Bible as his story of how he interacts with his creation. And through his grace, how he defeats the power of death, and gives us a chance at new life. Our loving and holy God became flesh, and he walked among us as we're celebrating here in the upcoming Christmas. The man Christ Jesus, the, with a purpose to bring salvation to all people and to separate us from the sin and death that awaits us if we don't turn from the sin of this world. And as we walk in that new life that Jesus gives us, He calls us, like we talked about, to a life of holiness. That's what he's called us to do. Romans 3 and 19, it says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in sight, For the law is the knowledge of sin, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference for all. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Paul is explaining to us here that in the law of Moses, the law of Moses was designed to point out the sinful nature of humanity. It was to show us that we are sinful. And it was to show us that we need a redeemer, that there's no way that we can separate ourselves unto God on our own, that it's impossible that we are sinful people. The power of sin is just far too great for us to break without Jesus. Only Jesus with the authority to overcome sin 
and death could break the power sin had over creation. Only he could do it. Only he can begin that process of the restoring relationship for us back to God himself. We can't do without Jesus. Without him, it is impossible. It shows we need Jesus. That was the point of the law. Our lives, our new lives we can have through Jesus, once we follow that path, um, are the result of God's grace and the work of Calvary. Calvary gave us that chance. Jesus' sacrifice on Calvary is what destroys our sins. And so we can walk in that very newness of life and to pursue after holiness. And the new life that we have been given so graciously by Jesus is not supposed to be a solo journey at all. Since Jesus desires to save all people, our lives of holiness should serve a purpose to pointing others back to God. That's the whole purpose. It's not for us to get saved and live at this thing as solo, all by ourselves, but to show other people the, gro- the gracious God that we have and to point people towards Him, which is our focus point two here, separated for God's purpose. Jesus' death, His burial, His resurrection, and the pouring out of His Spirit continued God's mysterious plan to restore humanity to Himself. Christ removed the veil that separated us from God and began the process of restoring all who respond to Him. 2 Corinthians 3 and 14 tells us this, But their minds were blinded. Until until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart, that covering, blocking them from seeing it. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the liberty to understand that word. But we all with open face beholding, as in the glass, the glory of the Lord, the changing unto the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So we understand that Jesus began the process of redemption and restoration, which involves separating us, us humanity, back to Himself. That is why He went to Calvary. That was the reason of death, the burial, and the resurrection. But how, as us as believers, are we supposed to be involved in the being separated for God's purpose? So let's look at three ways we can prioritize being separated into God. Number one, first and foremost, we must believe the gospel message that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. His death, His burial, His resurrection are the foundation of our redemption. We have to crucify our own sinful nature through repentance, and we must be buried with Him in baptism in the name of Jesus. That is a must. We see that Romans 6 and 4. It tells us, Therefore we are buried with Jesus by baptism unto death. Just like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that that old man is crucified with Jesus, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we should also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but he that liveth, he liveth unto God." We need to take on the death, the burial, and the resurrection just like Jesus did. And we do that through repentance, through baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, through the infill of the Holy Ghost. The repentance, we die out to our old self. The burial that Jesus went through, that's our baptism. We go down, buried in the water. The resurrection Jesus did, the Holy Ghost who resurrect as a new person, a new creature. Then when we are raised to life in Christ Jesus, and filled with His very own Spirit, God calls us to Himself. And when we hear His voice, it's up to us to respond to His calling, 
to respond to his calling to us. And that, and that begins that process of being separated from sin back to God. That's where that begins at. So number two, separating ourselves for God's purpose involves transforming and the renewing of our minds. The transforming and renewing of our minds. Romans 12 and 2. We're told, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Living under the power of sin influences the way that we think. It will influence the way that we think. When we begin to live for God, our thinking must change. It must be a change in our thinking. We can't think like the old sinful flesh used to think. But God doesn't expect for us to change alone. He doesn't expect us to change this renewing of our mind by ourselves. If we allow Him to work through us, He will change the way that we think through the Word of God, through the reading of the Word, the change, like we talked about, what you see, what you put in front of you, what you put inside of you, through His Word, through the Bible, through the Holy Ghost inside of you, you can help renew and change your mind and even His power. David understood the importance of the meditation of the heart and the words produced by the thoughts, by the stuff that we put inside of us. That's why he said in Psalms 19 and 14, he said, let the words of my mouth, Lord, and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. He knew that there was some, just like we talked about, little ears what we hear, little mouth what we say. He knows what you put inside of you. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of the heart, all my thoughts, let it be on God. By studying, by meditating on the God, His words and His thoughts, it's all anchored inside of Scripture. We get that Scripture inside us, the Word of God in us. It has to come back out of us. That will help the words of our mouth and, the, and our hearts to be acceptable to our holy God if it's based off the Word of God, if it's based off of that. When we are filled with God's Spirit and learn to hear His voice, then our very own attitudes will start to change because it's based off of what pleases God. If we really decide to do what pleases God, then it will change our whole attitudes. Philippians 4 and 8 tells us, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise at all, think on these things. Those are the things that we're supposed to be thinking on. That's what's supposed to be in our hearts, in our minds. When our minds are focused on the things of God, His purpose becomes our focus and our desire. His purpose will become what we focus on. It'll become what we desire to do. We want to think. At that point, we'll want to think on the things of God. We'll wake up wanting to think about the things of God. We'll want to have the pure, the lovely things, the things of good report. We'll have the virtue. We'll want to have all of that coming out of us. And if we have any praise, it will be for the Lord because we know of His greatness. It will become just natural to us. It'll just want to come out of us. And then number three is asking the right questions focuses our decisions on God's purpose. Asking the right questions. Psalm 119 and 5. David says, Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with the uprightness of heart and I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. David understood the importance of asking right questions. He asked that his actions reflect God's desires. He wanted his actions, the everything that he do to reflect the desires of God. He knew asking the right questions would lead him down the correct path and keep him right with the Lord. He knew if he was asked, he would be right with the Lord. We will always get in trouble if we do it our own way. Who can say amen to that? Do it your own way, you can get yourself in trouble. Sometimes it may turn out good to start off with, and we're like, ah, 
we got by that. We, we got through that. But then after a while, it comes back to bite us. We come to find out it wasn't the right way to do it. But if we ask God the right questions, He will, he will show us. He will point us down the correct path. He will lead us down the path to make the right decisions. And their decisions will be based off of God's purpose and not our own purpose. Right. <clears throat> so focus point number three today is pursuing holiness. Pursuing holiness. The pursuit of holiness is the act of continually reflecting God's image. The more we separate ourselves for God's purpose, the more we pursue holiness, the more of God's image we will reflect. Colossians 3 and 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, ye shall do also. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. And be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So in the book of Genesis, we read that Adam and Eve were made in the very image of God. When sin and death entered into the world through disobedience, sin began to damage and warp that image that God created man in. God's purpose is restore us to his image, as we talked about, that restoration, that redemption is what he has for us. The sin in the garden took us away from the image of God. And now through salvation, through repentance, excuse me, baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost, we can be brought back to having the right image of God within us. We need that image of God back inside of us because we are meant to reflect Jesus and His holiness to the lost of this world. Paul's, Paul tells us in, in Romans 6 and 20, he says, For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants of God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end of that is everlasting life. Sin was bringing forth death. It was bringing us to the end that was only going to be death. But now we have been made free from sin and became a servant to our holy and mighty God. We now have access to holiness, which is needed to have everlasting life. We need holiness to have everlasting life. God has called us to a life of holiness, which is part of his purpose in restoring our relationship with him, restoring that right relationship with him. I feel like I'm running out of time here. Y'all are already down. Just, whew. <laughs> uh -huh. So God has called us. So God has called us to a life of holiness, which is part of his purpose in restoring re a right relationship with him. So rejecting that pursuit of holiness, rejecting going after holiness is a rejection of God himself and his purpose because his purpose is for us to become holy before him. First Thessalonians 4 and 7 tells us, for God hath not called us unto uncleanliness, but he's called us unto holiness. He therefore that despises dis holiness despises not man, but God, and who hath also given us unto his Holy Spirit. So holiness is not about us at all. It's not about us. It's, it's not a human invention <coughs> Excuse me, to convince people to follow a set of rules. The purpose of the pursuit of holiness is to reflect God's image to the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. Amen. Try not to lose my voice here. Ephesians 4 and 24. 
And he that put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Holiness is being separated to God for his purpose. Our focus is on not what we or other people are separating from. My focus should not be on, well, Brother John here, he separated himself from the holiness by doing X, Y, Z. You know, that should not be that way. But we are representing, but it should be about who we're representing, that we're representing Jesus Christ. That should be our pursuit of holiness. <clears throat> it's not about what I can't do to get closer to Jesus, but it's what I can do to be more like Him. Not about the can'ts, what I'm not allowed to do, but it's what, what can I do? What can I do to be more like Jesus so I can shine that light to the world? If you're really wanting to pursue holiness, then God's purpose becomes our own purpose. So focus point four before I run out of time here. Continually separated to God's purpose. Our life of holiness, oh, I am out of time, is a continual journey of separating ourselves for God's purpose. The believer's action should call attention to God, His message, and His holiness. 1 Peter 2 and 9 tells us this, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who have called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. And I've always loved that verse. It is something you could shout about. Woo, yeah, we're a chosen generation. We're that royal priesthood. We're that holy nation, that peculiar people. Oh, yeah, that gets us excited. But we can't shout about that and forget the rest of the verse. Since we've been restored to God, what should we be doing for others? We're told in that verse we should show forth the praises of the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We should be reflecting that, what God gave us, reflecting that back to the world, showing forth those praises for that great salvation that we have. Understanding God's purpose, learning to separate ourselves from that purpose and pursuing holiness should influence our lives daily. But what is their ultimate goal? Our actions should work towards God's very purpose. And like we said, God's purpose is to restore wholeness to a broken world reconciling the world to himself. So we are the reflection of what others see. We are the reflection of God to the world. That's why it tells us in Matthew 5 and 14, ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. Neither do man put or men light a candle, put it under bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto the whole house. Let your light so shine before men that he may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. We are called to show the light of God to the world. We're supposed to be God's image and we're supposed to show that light to the world. We're supposed to show it through our actions. We can't hide what Jesus has given us, put it under a bushel, hide it away. And we might not think that we can be impactful at all. Oh, but I'm not like the pastor. I'm not like this. I, I'm not that strong. I can't show forth that light. But if you've ever been in a really pitch black dark room and even a little pin light, just a little tiny light shines. You can see that light. Because wherever a light comes forth, it pushes back the darkness. No matter how big or small it is, you can see that little light. So even if you feel like you're just that little light, you can be impactful. You can show that there's a great God out there. And you can show people how to get to God. And the kids are back there. I'll skip all this. Um, so we are made in God's image, and God is creative and active. A very first glimpse of God in Scripture, He is at work to create the world in Genesis chapter 1. Jesus spent His earthly ministry serving and ministering to others. So we too are capable of serving. He, that's His whole purpose, and their purpose is to serve also. we got to serve in our community, and most importantly, in our church, to show others about God, to join in together to serve each other, fulfilling the purpose we are created for and the meeting the needs that glorify God. And I'm going to close here today. We've went through this whole discipleship series on um, holiness. We first talked about the temple of God, how we have the Holy Ghost inside of us. We're the temple of God. So we need to honor God by the lives that we live, live a life that's pleasing unto God. Then we talked about how we need to separate ourselves unto from the world, that our God is holy, so has called us to be holy. 
We read in Leviticus where Moses told the people, the Old Testament, he said, be you holy for the Lord your God is holy. Then in 1 Peter in the New Testament, he said, because it's written, be you holy for I am holy. He gave us that. We know in both old and new, we are both called to be holy. We need to reflect God's holiness to the world, not be like our old self. We talked about the fruit of the Spirit, to walk towards holiness and desire to get closer to God. That Then we become more like Him and we start showing the identity of God by the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. We're here to show that. And then last time we were here, we talked about once we get the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit working inside of us, the Christian character we should be showing should be being honest, having integrity, and showing humility. So I hope and pray that you take what we learned these past five weeks and use it. Respond to it to get a closer walk with the Lord. I hope you decide to walk in holiness. Seek after ways to get closer to God and show the attributes of God to the world. Get that fruit working in your lives and shining that light for all the world to see. Take it to your family, to your co-workers, to servers at restaurants, cashiers, to follow when you your fellow people when you're in the store. Um, shine that light so all the world can see that you have been separating the darkness and they can be too. Be you holy for the Lord God is holy. God bless. Thank <laughs> you.